this is an ASUS ROG Strix X299 Gaming E, that's quite a long name, and this one is a Tough X299 Mark I. Both of these are new X299 motherboards from ASUS, and we're going to be taking a look at both of them in this video, as they're fairly similar, come at a pretty similar price point, just £10 apart, and are also pretty awesome. So as I mentioned, these are X299, which means they're both featuring the new LGA2066 socket. This is fairly similar to the 2011 V3 socket, and actually has backwards compatibility with your CPU cooler, so if you already have an X99 motherboard that fits, uh, you know, and a CPU cooler that fits on it, then this uh, fits exactly the same which is really nice. You also still have quad channel memory although if you are using a Kaby Lake X CPU, uh, the two sort of low end X299 CPUs, then uh, half of the RAM DIMMs won't work on here which again is really rather annoying and just uh, feel free to check out the other video I did on the whole X299 platform for that. M.2 is a massive thing on both of these motherboards as they both have two slots. One of them is vertical and the other is actually hidden under an M.2 heatsink. The vertical one on the Strix board is on the right hand side on the center just under the 24 pin and the tough board has the vertical one right on the bottom uh, down where the front panel headers and stuff like that are. Both also have new M.2 heat sinks. The Strix is a beautiful chipset heat sink that sort of elongates uh, under the second X16 PCIe slot and this is a very beautiful thing. If you do pick up this board just spend a while just staring at that because it looks lovely from every direction. Uh, but if you pick up the tough board you'll be incredibly impressed with the M.2 heat sink that they've designed here. You have this removable plate that has a heat pad on the bottom. The actual piece of metal is pretty thick and pretty heavy, which is nice for obviously conducting heat. And you actually have a chipset fan, which was actually really quiet as well. I barely noticed it on, although it definitely was on while I was using it. So uh, really, really impressive with that. Uh, obviously, it's the, the best that you can hope for. There's a little slot that allows the air to be sucked in from the chipset heatsink and down through the M.2 slot. Uh, just, it, it's an amazing uh, design and I really would like to see a lot more of this in the future for M.2 drives. And just as a nice added extra, the tough board also comes with a GPU support. I'm not entirely sure how well this would work on certain GPUs that have fans that come basically right out to the edge, but nonetheless it is quite nice that they include it. Both boards use a 4 and an 8 pin for CPU power as the new uh, X299 CPUs are pretty power hungry. They go up to 140 watts at the moment, although the higher core count chips will likely be even higher than that in the future, so do bear that in mind. Uh, you also have uh, a few sort of debug LEDs bo on both boards. The tough board has the nicest design with the sort of uh, plastic shrouding around it to show you uh, the sort of boot LEDs. So, you know, your, your CPU memory uh, and then you've got uh, VGA boot and just overall power LED. And also, again, on the tough, you actually have a mem OK button as well. If you are doing memory overclocking, you just want to check that they're all working. But the Strix does also have some LEDs there too. As I mentioned on the Strix, just under the 24 pin is the vertical M.2 slot, but you also have the USB 3.1 front panel header. This is the new sort of Gen 2 one that's meant to support USB Type C. I've not seen many cases with this yet, although it's nice that that comes pre uh, sort of as standard now and is also on the tough board in the same place. You have one Aura header on the tough board down at the bottom, sort of left hand side, but on the Strix, this is where it gets interesting. You have one header up at the top and one header down at the bottom, as well as a second three pin header, which is actually an addressable RGB header. This one is for the RGB LED strips that we saw at Computex where you can actually address each individual LED as you go along so that you can have waves of colors and stuff like that. You basically have a 5 volt a data pin and then a ground pin uh, on that uh, sort of 5 volt addressable one. So uh, that's actually quite cool. I'll be interested to see more people including uh, I saw Bit Phoenix at Computex uh, doing this but uh, plenty of other people I expect will be showing similar things off. But it's nice that this board has it although the tough board is obviously not meant to necessarily be as showy I guess and therefore you only have one standard uh, just plug in your LED strip to this header header at the bottom of the board. The rear I.O. for the tough board is actually pretty interesting so you have five USB 2 ports you also have uh, one USB 3.1 port as well as a type C port four USB 3.0s two gigabit ethernets although they are actually different controllers so while you should still be able to team them just fine if you want to it is still quite nice especially if this is going to be more of a sort of 
workstation board, I guess, perhaps, rather than just standard gaming systems. Uh, and you also have a full audio setup as well with uh, 7.1 audio and SPDIS. The Strix board is fairly similar, although considering this is the more expensive board, it actually has less ports, which is kind of confusing. But either way, you have two USB 2 ports, four USB 3.0 ports, one Type-C and one USB 3.1 Gen 2 port, as well as uh, one gigabit ethernet, AC Wi-Fi with Bluetooth 4.0, and uh, 7.1 audio with SPDIF as well. Both of those audio setups, by the way, are powered by Realtek on both of these boards, although that's under the Supreme FX name for the Strix board. Taking a look on the other side of the board, you will find eight SATA ports, although I would mention that depending on which CPU you are using, you will have a little bit of trouble with those, uh, especially ports five to eight, especially on the Strix. If you're using the X4 slot in the middle, I believe that will either switch off or you'll have to switch between using ports five and eight there. So do bear that in mind if you are planning on loading these out, but you're planning on using a Kaby Lake CPU. And of course, when we're talking about storage and PCIe, both boards have the new VROC header for the uh, sort of uh, RAID key that you can buy separately. Again, this is a little bit uh, kind of nasty of Intel to do, really. It's, it's obviously functionality that the board already has, and this seems to at very least just be a key that you buy rather than, you know, actually adding some functionality, but uh, nonetheless, it's there if you need it. Moving on to testing them, I did test both of them, and the only real difference between them in terms of the BIOS anyway is just the, the color scheme as far as I can see. So the Tough board has a lot more of a sort of blue aesthetic, whereas the RG board has a lot more of a red aesthetic. Both have a lot of options in there, especially to do with depending on what CPU you have again. So uh, it's a kind of crazy platform. There's, as I said, a lot of options to be had. And of course, you still have the, the regular stuff like Q fan control, which is obviously very nice. My apologies for the change of top setup and opinion here, as the original bit of this video that I filmed uh, had uh, a few, I suppose, technically inaccuracies in terms of uh, some things that came to light after some new testing. So hopefully this is a bit more of a better clarification and hopefully will present a better overall opinion and review for you. When it comes to overclocking, I was very impressed with the software on the, the boards on the, on the BIOS. Uh, the, the Extreme Tweaker menu is brilliant. You actually have a Tweaker's Paradise uh, you know, sub-menu, which is brilliant, uh, and a load of very detailed settings are available to you, which is really great. Now, I do want to mention there is a bit of a problem with pretty much all X299 motherboards. Uh, something that Der, Der Bauder, the German overclocker, made a, a video on, and it's something that I'm noticing in my own testing as well. The problem we have is the voltage regulation modules on the motherboards. These are obviously a hardware feature. These are uh, the, the VRMs or the things that control the voltage that go to the CPU and other parts of the, the board. Uh, and the problem with these is that they basically just get way, way, way too hot. So when you're doing a high overclock, basically anything I found over 1.4 volts, in fact, probably even 1.35 volts, and especially high clock speed, so anywhere above about 4.6 gigahertz, uh, the VRMs overheat and the core clock will crash when you actually try and put the CPU under load. Now both of these boards were able to manage about 4.6 gigahertz at 1.3 volts with a 7820X, that's the 8 core, and I will be testing the MSI board I have as well with a 10 core, 8 core and a 6 core as well to see how it does, but I would make it clear that if you are planning on doing some heavy overclocking, uh, it looks like a lot of the X299M on the boards aren't necessarily going to be for you right now, including these two. If however, However, you are planning on picking up one of the Kaby Lake CPUs, the uh, lower end 7740 and uh, 7720 I think it is, uh, those chips will likely overclock pretty well on these boards as obviously they're only four cores uh, and have a lot less of a power draw than the Skylake X, you know, proper X299 chips. So from that I want to move on to the scoring. I will be scoring the boards separately, although they are pretty similar in terms of both price and features. So uh, starting with the Strix, I was pretty impressed with it, although it is still about £300 at the time of filming, so value for money, it's probably going to be a, uh, a 3.5. I think in terms of performance, because of the overclocking issues, I'm going to go with, I think, a 4.5 with a uh, functionality score of, I think, a 4. In terms of styling for me, it is pretty nice. I'm going to go with a 4 here and a 4 for Tech GB score and a silver award. This is going to be pretty similar for the Tough board. So uh, the Tough, I'm going to say uh, probably a 4 for value for money. It's a little bit cheaper and a little bit nicer in a few features, including the M.2 heatsink. Uh, and in terms of performance, I'm going to go with, I think, a 4.5 here. In terms of functionality, I'm going to go with a 4.5 as well. Uh, styling, I'm actually going to go with a 4.5 here because I personally prefer the aesthetic of this one over the ROG, but that's my personal opinion. And the Touch and BB score of probably a 4 as well with also a silver award. Both of these 
these boards are pretty good, obviously very nice feature sets. I personally prefer the tough board, but I want to make it clear that the overclocking issues are still an issue, and especially when it comes to the newer i9 chips that are coming out in a few months, which are going to be up to 18 cores. The voltage regulation modules of VRMs on these will likely struggle even running at stock speeds, depending what frequencies are, so you will have a, a trouble overclocking, uh, and that is something to, to be aware of. Obviously, this is the X series, this is the high-end desktop platform, uh, so to not really be able to push overclocks due to the motherboard rather than the CPU is a bit of a shame. So after that marathon of a double motherboard review, let me know what you think of them in the comments down below. I'd be very interested to hear what you think. If you want to see any more about these motherboards or just check out the price when and where you watch this, I'll leave links to Amazon and Overclockers UK when possible in the links in the description down below. If you want to support me and check out more videos, feel free to do that. I'll leave some over here when they do pop up in the end cards. And of course, feel free to take a look at the uh, you know general Amazon and Overclockers UK affiliate links. Those genuinely do help me out. They genuinely help pay the rent. So if you do that, that would be fantastic. Uh, and otherwise, I guess that's kind of it, really. As I said, feel free to check out some of the other videos. Make sure you subscribe if this is the first video of mine you're watching and you enjoyed it. And let me know what you thought of the video, the motherboards, or anything else in the comments down below. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all in the next one.